Hello and welcome to episode 129 of the Clean Energy Show. I'm Brian Stockton. I'm James Whittingham. This week, I take a closer look at green hydrogen. Apparently, there is a whole rainbow of hydrogen. Brian, gray, blue, purple, turquoise. I'm not even kidding. And even black and white hydrogen. And that's when you watch old footage of the Hindenburg exploding. <laughs> What's faster than a Lamborghini and a Ferrari? A Kia. That's right. A Kia. In other news, up is down, black is white, and James is a handsome son of a bitch. You're damn straight. Plus, we asked, and sure enough, there is a study on how far out offshore wind turbines have to be before you can really see them. And it's roughly the same distance, Brian, as the distance between that... It's roughly the same distance that France keeps the United Kingdom away. Anti-lock brakes are coming to electric bicycles. That's right. The nanny state wants you to stop flying over your front handlebars. All in the name of safety. All that and more on this edition of The Clean Energy Show. And also this week, Brian, I visit my first utility solar farm and Dodge. Dodge, yes, they're making an EV and they've wrecked the idea that electric vehicles will be quiet. And I'm quite angry mm -hmm. about that. <laughs> and will Germany block at shutting down all of its nuclear power by the end of the year? I hope you're doing well. You were off last week due to back injury. Yeah, I, I never thought it would be bad enough that I couldn't record a podcast. But um, I did contemplate, like, you know, lying flat on my back <laughs> and somehow getting a microphone. But uh, that would have been so much work to set up. I, You know, if, if I had a servant to kind of set all that up for me, I, I could have done it. It's but, a shame. Yeah, in the meantime, it's now manageable, I guess. And uh, yeah, hopefully it doesn't happen again. Well, it will. It keeps happening. I mean, is this the worst it's ever been? Yeah, I would say so. But oh, I, no. I don't know. I feel like I've got a handle on the right stretching that I need to do. So, you know, hopefully it's okay. Well, glad to hear it because, you know, all the th preparation I did for last show, I've forgotten it now. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's like I had a lot, a lot ready to go that seemed like distant memories now. And it's only a week ago. Wow, my opening jokes, I wrote those last week for oh, last week's God show. Oh, my God's sake. So. I thought they seemed dated. Yeah, that, that news is a little <laughs> bit stale, but I thought they were both worth talking about, so. Okay. Well, um, let me talk about this, because I, uh, right after, uh, I guess it was Friday, I went to a utility solar farm in Weyburn. Uh, that is an hour and a half south of us. Now, my son and I just... You know, he was feeling, uh, I, I basically said we can't do the vacation he wanted to do. So I said, hey, let's just go on a little road trip. And then I yeah. thought, well, maybe I should go look at that solar farm an hour and a half south because it's a direction we haven't gone very often. And uh, found it fairly easily. It's not far from this small city of, what, 10,000 people or something like that. Yep. And it is the first one that I've seen in our own jurisdiction here uh, ever because they just started putting them online. It's uh, it puts out up to ten megawatts into the system. It's rated at thirteen though. Um, so basically, in the summer when it goes over ten, they waste you know whatever's over ten. Yeah, the grid can't handle it. It's near a substation. Uh, what struck me disappointingly though was how small it was. Okay, this is run by this is a partnership between I think two First Nations, a, a solar company from. Um, Halifax, Nova Scotia, the east coast of Canada that we actually uh, get some information from because I had some questions on the previous show. Yeah. And they were very helpful. Uh, but I was struck at how small it was. Like I haven't seen a lot of so solar farms in my day. I've been through California and Arizona and I've seen some, so I probably haven't seen them all down there, but I saw a few and what I saw were old and big. And this struck me as 2005-ish. Like it, it just seemed like, Give it the times, man. Like, the, the, yeah, you're late to get onto the grid, but you, what do you need to prove? Wh what about solar? I mean, I've had solar for, well, how many years have you had it? Five or six years now? Yeah, five or six years, yep. And we know it works, and we're hooked up to the same utility. Why can't you just, you know, I don't know, triple the size of it? But isn't that also encouraging because it kind of looks small, but you're still getting 10 megawatts. That seems pretty good. It's... It's not, though, compared to the size of what they're building now, including in our neighboring province of Alberta. They're building yeah. things many times that in, in one fell swoop. Um, and, yeah, well, first of all, when I got there, 
I heard this noise and I thought, oh, solar panels make noise. And I looked up <laughs> and it was a guy on a riding lawnmower. <laughs> <laughs> and they made all the, I, at first I thought the panels weren't working. So let me describe what this is. This is a single axis solar farm. So if you're new to what that is, I'm going to describe it in simple terms. Imagine a rod going from south to north, uh, hoisted up above the ground by about, oh, let's say six or seven, eight feet up. And then the panels are placed, uh, elongated on there along that tube and they rotate to the east in the morning when the sun comes up in the east. Yeah. And at noon, they're flat. But I was there at four o'clock in the afternoon and they were flat. So I think they made them flat for the guy who was mowing because there was a few <laughs> off in the distance that were where they should have been, which is facing west. So yeah. they will track the sun from east to west and get more power in the morning than they otherwise would. You would, you know, ultimately, normally a fixed panel faces south at the best angle yeah. to get the most sun year round over the course of a year. Well, these follow it. So the, um, you know, the, uh, the pattern of that, if you look at the chart that I have there, you know how our charts are. They're kind of, is it a bell curve? Is that uh, fair to say? Yeah, shaped like a bell, yep. Uh, this one is kind of like a flattened bell. So instead of gradually going up, it shoots up fairly quickly and then is flat throughout the most of the day up around where our peak is and then comes back down again. So you're not, I don't, I don't see how it can get as much sun midday as, as a panel that's fixed and facing in an optimal direction. Maybe that peak should be a bit lower on that chart that I'm showing you, but that's basically the idea that you put this money into tracking equipment and extra hardware, and it will give you more sun throughout the day from the same yeah. panels because it will track. And then also, Brian, of course, there's the, these are bifacial, so they will pick up sun off the ground, so they're spaced out so that um, you know there is some unshadowed ground to pick up. But also when they announced this, they said there was going to be goats and or sheep grazing there. So it could be multi-use, yeah. but that's, that hasn't happened yet. Maybe eventually. Um, yeah. So I, I just, it was a bit underwhelming. I was hoping for something bigger and, uh, basically, um, they're, they're making another one near the landfill in Regina here. Mm -hmm. And I just, I drove by that on the way home to see what's up with that. It is, it's going, it's actually, they're actually marked out where everything's going to go and they're going to have a battery installation project there. Um, it's just that, Brian, we're the sunniest place in Canada. Come on, man. Mm -hmm. We could do better than this. Plus, we've got like half of our grid is coal powered. We could do better. It just, it seems like, oh, we don't trust this. We're scared of this. Um, you know, maybe we need to build the big plants, the places near the coal plants, which is, would work out fairly well because that's part of our, our sunniest belt is down where the coal plants are, ironically. That yeah. would be cool. Yeah, well, maybe that's how all the coal ended up there, was from all the sunshine. <laughs> well, I remember you had a story um, about coal plants shutting down in the United States, and they were putting solar around. Because yeah. the, the grid ties were already there. Yeah, no, it totally, absolutely makes sense. And uh, yeah, like, of course, on my own house, I've got solar, you've got solar. Um, but I am trying to electrify everything in my house, so I'm, you know, quickly finding out that I, I should have installed maybe three times as many <laughs> solar panels um, when I initially did my project. Well, how can but, you do that? How? Where? No, there's I no mean, roof I, left. You know, I, there's not much roof left, but, um, you know, it is what it is. But I did finally talk to somebody who was willing, uh, an HVAC installer willing to put in an air source heat pump to heat my house. How did you find I this was, person? Uh, just Googling and uh, and making an inquiry on the web. Okay. Who, where did you make the inquiry? To the person you Googled or? Yeah, the, the company. Okay. Well, that's cool. Yeah. And I think I had maybe contacted them a few months ago and they never got back to me or something. Oh, right, Everybody's right. super busy in right. the trades, but um, I finally did hear from them. And yes, they do air source heat pumps in our ridiculously frigid, cold climate. Um, it. I, I was just you know, worried I would not ever find somebody who just wasn't even willing to put, put, you know, take out a, uh, 
a natural gas furnace. But uh, anyway, so it is possible. It is being done around here. They also do uh, geothermal, but they don't typically recommend that for urban properties. They, they prefer to do geothermal for rural properties where you have more space. You can do a horizontal pipe rather than if it's in the city, you've got to do a vertical and those aren't quite as good and, um, you know, very, very expensive. So this is still expensive, an air source heat pump, but it's, uh, it's going to be a lot less than geothermal. And uh, I think, you know, this is definitely the way of the future, uh, e even around here. So I, I think I'm probably going to do it. My son was asking me about this because I was telling them and he was saying, why is Brian spending so much money to be first, to be, to have a zero <laughs> footprint? And I said, I don't know. I've just been have, thinking about it for years and years. Like it, you know, as soon as I went solar, my thought was, okay, excellent. I've got the solar. Now, how do I get rid of my furnace? Like it, it just seemed like the logical next step. Okay. Okay. Uh, it, it, it's just, you're spending a lot of money on these things and you're not, you're not getting the payback for it. You're doing it yeah. and you're not really saving the planet. You're just lowering your own footprint, which is admirable, of course, to everyone listening to the show. But yeah, uh, the, the catch here is of course, like 30% of our grid is coal fired. So I think in terms of my like carbon footprint, I'll probably end up kind of, uh, it, it'll be a bit of a wash, but of course, eventually the grid here will uh, clean up. And the other thing is we do have grants available for this in Canada. It's not as generous as the ones recently announced in the U S with the Biden, mm -hmm. um, what was that called again? Inflation reduction act. That's correct. Yeah. So, but I did the first step, which is apply for the Canada greener homes grant. You fill out a thing on the web. So they're going to do an evaluation of my home and then you get up to five grand for, um, you know, green type renovations, so, uh, and there's a little bit of a provincial tax rebate, so I might get, a, you know, a couple grand back there. Hmm. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's expensive, but, um, again, the other impetus was we don't have air conditioning here. Right. And so I, I just didn't want to put in normal air conditioning and then five, 10 years ago from now have to rip it up because everyone's going to have to get rid of their natural gas in, in five or 10 years. So it's definitely going to cost more than just putting in air conditioning, but it, uh, you know, gets rid of my natural gas. So yeah, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Will it though? Will it get rid of your natural gas? Will you, will use uh, resistive heating as a backup? Yeah. This unit has a resistive heater backup. So Which is around... not, not efficient and not cheap to run. No. Like once it hits minus 20, the, the heat pump has difficulty. So the resistance heat backs up, um, that, but you know, like right now my natural gas bill is $110 a month. Uh, equalized throughout the year. So, you know, I should be able to get that to zero. Uh, so it, it probably will still end up costing more than that. It'll be probably more than an extra 110 Are we talking water heating here too? Yeah. So the unit that they showed me, it's a Nordic heat pump. Um, it doesn't heat your hot water, but apparently it preheats it. So this is a function of this particular one that they're selling to me. It does like 30 to 50% of your hot water needs. So it sort of preheats your hot water and then you need a, a regular hot water heater to kind of uh, finish it off. But the idea, like I, I have a natural gas water heater too. Right. So um, switch that out to a heat pump water heater, hopefully. Okay. Well, it's tricky where we live because it does get down to minus 40. It can. You have to plan for the worst case scenarios. Yeah. Um, and certainly minus 20s and 30s Celsius and minus 40 Fahrenheit Celsius is possible. So... Yeah, but this was super encouraging to find that it, this is actually being done around here, that, um, you know, we are still going to be the last probably to get off natural gas because, you know, this is not going to be cheap and there is a subsidy, but it's still going to be kind of expensive. Um, but yeah, this is totally possible and hopefully I, I can prove that and report back. Well, I do expect subsidies to come down in Canada too, some for eventually for because this is planned. And we are heavily influenced by what the States does with policy. Yeah. And sometimes that hurts us and sometimes it helps us. Uh, but also um, heat pumps are generally put into highly insulated houses. It's like yeah. an electric car. When you make an electric car, it can't do as much as maybe you want it to uh, with the battery size. So you make the cars lighter. You, you use yeah. carbon fiber, you use aluminum. And in the case of a house, you make it the most 
energy efficient you can. So are you taking any steps there? Yeah, well, we have over the years, like we've upgraded the windows and we have we have spray foam. a bunch of my bomb shelter is spray foamed here, as I mentioned last week. It's also padding um, in case there is a bomb, nice and yeah. soft. And uh, we're doing our, part of our, our roof this year as well. So we've, I was been reporting, we've got leaks in our roof. So we're going to spray foam that over the next several right. months. So we will, you know, the house will be much, much better insulated than when we bought it. And then the only thing left to go would be like the bedrooms and the living room could still use some extra insulation. So that's, we probably will do that next, but, but having our vaulted ceiling properly insulated will actually help a lot. Oh, Brian, I want to say a shout out to Matthew Pointer who pulled up beside me in his Tesla yesterday and much to my daughter's amusement, had a conversation with me between cars. She's never seen that before. <laughs> and I said, girl, in the old days, oh, yeah. people used to stop and talk. Before Strangers would talk. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we even phone people with, with corded phones. Um, but he's one of the people in the, the local EV community, and he had roof racks on his Tesla. And um, uh, I asked him, you know, why are the roof racks on? And he says, because I might use them for skiing. And of course, it's not skiing season, and, and not water skiing season. I, I guess he just leaves them on. And they, they're cool roof racks, the Tesla roof racks. You know, yeah. they're, they're, they look slick, but... Um, he says they're also pretty easy to take off and don't affect his range. He's got lots of range in his car. Another thing I wanted to mention is that I saw a commercial uh, because we downloaded this app called Fubo for soccer because that's where the English Premier League soccer is on this year. It's yep. they're always changing rights now. It's a different app. By the way, it's better than DAZN, which it was last time, but more expensive. Um, and I saw, and they have weird ads on these things, okay? Because, you know, they don't know, it's new and they don't know who to sell ads to. So I saw <laughs> lots of ads for North Dakota repeated over and over again. Okay. <laughs> Apparently, North Dakota is a cool place with one tall building, which I believe we stayed in when we went to the Fargo Film Festival there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not dissing North Dakota. I, I, I love it. There's many aspects of North Dakota I love. And I, I just saw an ad for lab-grown diamonds, and we just talked about that on the show not long ago. And now I'm seeing ads yeah. for it. I mean, wow. you can actually it's commercialized. It's it's. But I'm wondering, you know, now that it's real, if you gave, if you were a person who I don't like diamonds, I don't give a crap about diamonds. I I'm not married. I don't believe in that stuff. Um, I'm not an old romantic person, but. If you were, would a lab-grown diamond be a cop-out compared to a real diamond? I mean, for people. I mean, yeah. I'm asking you to speculate here, but do you think that there'd be any difference? I mean, or would you even well, tell the person you're giving it to, hey, it was growing in a lab, honey, from a Big Mac that was rotting in the corner? Is it the kind of thing where a guy could put on like one of those loops in a diamond shop and look at it and go, oh, this is lab-grown, this is crap? I, that's a good question. And if you are a listener, we have a lot of smart people listening to this show. Yeah. Email us, clean energy, at, clean, sorry, clean energy show at gmail.com. Uh, I, that's a question I'd love to know the answer to. That's a, a very interesting question. Yeah. Cause I think it's something like cubic zirconia. That's another one where like I, you know, the professionals can tell the difference between a cubic zirconia and a di diamond, but you and I probably not. Ah, so they'll have less value if they're easier to make. The question is, because, you know, Canada's north relies on diamond mining. It's a big industrial economic yeah. uh, impact up there. Will it be affected? I don't know. However, of course, lab-grown diamonds have, you know, less environmental impact, which is why we're talking about them in the first place. Another thing I saw uh, when I was searching for, for cars, trying to buy one, as I was on the uh, Hyundai Canada website, and I noticed something new there. They said, try an EV before you buy an EV. So you can book a multi-day test drive with an EV, which I think is a great idea. And they're using the service, yeah. um, what's it called? Turo, which I guess is in some Canadian cities now. I think Vancouver and Toronto, perhaps. Yeah. So you can't do it everywhere, but... You know, I mean, that would be one where you could manually just go rent one at Turo in the States. People have done that and, you know, just had one for a few days to see how they like it. Because uh, it's hard, you know, nobody, uh, you know, I'd like to drive one and see what they're like, really. But, 
But Hyundai also, you know, they're having a hard time keeping up with demand. So, I, I, you know, do they really need a program like this to sell EVs? Because, you know, they tend to sell out pretty quickly. I think I saw somebody on, on Facebook had a EV6 in where we live. Are they out already? Like, the, I didn't know they were coming. That, that caught me by surprise. Yeah, there's just, there's at least one around, yeah. There's, so they're starting to trickle out. Well, the question is, how many will they make? Uh, you know, because that's... I'm hoping they will, the demand is there. The reviews are still flowing in for the uh, yeah. Ionic 5. And um, we talked last time about Mike having one, a friend of mine, and he really loves it. So, No, and we have an update coming up as well on the, the EV6. But also I wanted to mention, I've, I saw a Rivian in the wild, a Rivian R1T electric pickup truck. I didn't know that any had made it up here, anywhere near here, but I was. it, it was just outside of Moose Jaw. My favorite town, Moose Jaw. On the Trans-Canada, the number one that goes coast to coast, east to west. Yeah. And that's interesting because other people have spotted them previously in the summer. I wonder if somebody's test driving one back and forth or what's going on with <laughs> yeah. that. I don't know. But, um, you know, hopefully the charging situation is okay for them since they were on the Trans-Canada. As yeah. we've said many times, yeah. the Don Tesla charging situation isn't great. Oh, no, it's not. And I, I was, you know, as I was getting serious about buying an EV, I was looking at PlugShare, the app you use for um, finding chargers and which ones are broken. And yeah, it's just, it's not good. It's not good. It's true. We made a joke last time about the Petro Canada network being, you know, like buying a lottery ticket. Well, it, it, they're all down and that's mm -hmm. a gas station. So it's a, it's, it's a company owned partially by Warren Buffett, the oil sands company, Suncor. So I'm getting paranoid about that. Uh, also, I thought I'd mention, because I am looking as a Chevy Bolt uh, EV, that there was a, a fella on the uh, Chevy Bolt forum that hit 200,000 miles on his 2020 Bolt, and that's 322,000 kilometers. Now, these were mostly highway miles because he has a really long commute. If I don't know why, mm -hmm. maybe he's a drug dealer. <laughs> Who could say? <laughs> but he's charged a to rum a runner. It charges you 100% every day and using it all, uh, plus one or two fast charges per day for a very long commute. And um, by my calculations on what he showed of the dash, it may have lost 15% of its range, uh, which isn't bad. I mean, this is no. a, you don't expect any car to last the 322,000 kilometers or 200,000 miles. And the fact that this isn't just handed off to some teenager to use for local driving at that point, which is how I see EVs going when they lose their range. Yeah. But that's still a pretty good range and he's still using it for that purpose. He's just, you know, he's having to fast charge it maybe a bit more often, uh, especially in the winter time, he says, when it gets cold. I don't know what his definition of cold is because he's from the United States, but anyway. And also yeah, a shout out does. to Nestor's Bakery up in Saskatoon, our sister city here in the province that has an electric transit van, a Ford uh, transit van, uh, electric, which is, I didn't think we'd see any of those around either. And there's a picture of it on Facebook and, you know, um, they're using, there's, they say they save enough in gas by switching to this to make the van payment. Yeah. So it's free. I believe it. It's free. It. Yeah. And good for the environment, good for your business uh, brand. Yeah, and uh, you know, less, they're not even factoring in uh, maintenance, so that's that. Brian, as we know, as we say all the time, is what's going to really move things along when people start to realize, because money speaks, money talks, and you know, when money starts making a difference. Let's get into some updates from past shows. Uh, Finland's new nuclear plant has had to cut power to zero from a failed turbine. Yeah, we've mentioned this nuclear plant before because it was finally coming online. And, and I, I think I initially reported on this because it was a good news story because we, we seem to be sort of bashing nuclear a lot lately because it's so expensive and there's all these delays and cost overruns. And, it you know, it's, it's literally taking uh, decades to get these things up. But, you know, since this one in Finland was coming online, I thought, oh, OK, we better report on this. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, uh, power dropped to zero on Monday. They were, so they're still in trial operations. It's not um, in full-blown operation. And um, they had a turbine fail and uh, sort of killed the whole thing. Nothing dangerous, nothing uh, exploded or melted down or anything. 
But uh, this reactor was supposed to start production um, in 2009. That's how long it's taken. That's... And it's going to be apparently a few months more because it's not working right now. You know, Brian, when things are 13 years overdue, money gets spent in that time. <laughs> yeah, so it's not really just does. time, it's money. Yeah. And it's a, a 1.6 gigawatt uh, reactor that's going to be the fifth reactor in Finland and its biggest reactor. And this is expected to produce 14% of the country's electricity. But, you know, you put up a solar farm, can put it up in a few months, and it'll work. Um, yeah. This... And you and I aren't nuclear scientists. Well, no. Um, technically. So that will influence, you know, our decision around these things. But it's just like solar, wind, and batteries is just so damn simple. Uh, why don't we move to that? And we'll, we'll talk about that a bit more when we get to Germany later on. And I know I bring him up, but the boy, my boy, uh, says, Dad, you know what the world's biggest uh, greenhouse gas is? Do you know the answer to this? It's right there in the script, so of course you do. Like the biggest emitter? The biggest greenhouse gas that is there in the atmosphere is water vapor. Oh, okay. And you know what hydrogen emits? Water vapor. Water vapor? Yeah, is this going to be a problem? Uh, well, I heard about it on a podcast, a good podcast <laughs> oh, yeah. by experts. Was it ours? <laughs> and it wasn't ours. It was actual people who, it was one, it was really an in the weeds podcast with experts in the field talking to other experts, only experts, you know, who work in the industry listened to it. And they said that more study needs to be done because it hasn't been studied. So if you're looking at airliners flying around and emitting water vapor, is that a good thing? Um Maybe people have some comments, and you know how to get all of us, cleanenergyshow.gmail.com. But I just wanted to throw that out there because he was giving me a hard time about that. And now something for some extremely disappointing news. <laughs> we try to focus on the good news. Here's some disappointing news. The Dodge Charger, that is the muscle car that you hear driving down your street at night, 11 at night, waking you up because some teenager has got to feel better about himself, so he bought a Dodge Charger, uh, a muscle car, as they call them. They still exist. They were a big thing in the 70s. Uh, I know you had a Pinto and called it a muscle car. Was it a Pinto or something? No, I had a Gremlin. A Gremlin. Oh, that's even worse, I think. I think I had a Pinto for like a week before it broke, literally. I'm not even <laughs> kidding. And yeah, so they're making an EV, and they're going to make them all EVs, but they have noise. Pretend noise, Brian. In fact, the whole back is this pretend exhaust was essentially a dispersion speaker for V8 engine noise. And it's just it's annoying. Annoying. Let's play the clip here, okay? Because I do have a clip that I want to play. Uh, it's just going to take me a second to get it. All right, this is what it sounds like. Yeah, I'm going to boo that guy off the road, the first person to buy one of those. Because you'll have the option of turning the stupid thing off. And then yeah. you'll go to a muffler shop. Muffler shops will now be like an audio-visual place where they'll <laughs> have put in a bigger amp to make the car louder instead yeah, of want to find the muffler. That's probably a really good business to get into. <laughs> there you go, kids. If you're just still in high school, uh, there's a business opportunity for you. And that is just depressing. Uh, we don't want cars to make noise. Because, you know, if you get beat by a Porsche, the Porsche doesn't make any noise. What are you emulating? You're emulating a slow car. Yeah. So good for you. I, I know I know. people keep telling me on the street, I like the sound and the smell of fumes. And, <laughs> well, you're going to die early and um, good luck to you. I, I don't know. Uh, Brian and Elon Musk news this week and... Uh, I hesitate to even mention his name anymore. Population collapse due to low birth rates is a much bigger risk to civilization than global warming. This is a guy who's trying to save global warming by advancing, speeding up the electrification of transportation, which he has successfully done, I would argue. Um, 
you know, I've known this, we've all known it. We all knew that the world would, we would solve hunger and the world would become more equitable and we would stop, we would educate, people would get access to education, we'd stop having 20 babies, right? Or, you know, the, the birth rate would go down to what it is in, yeah. you know, say Quebec is like 2.0 um, per person and that is a declining birth rate. Yeah. So you bring in people from other countries that will eventually, uh, everyone's going to catch up, we're all going to have a middle class and maybe not make so many babies. I mean, he's, it's not like we're all going to go to make babies, Brian. That's my argument. We're not going to go out and say, oh, I got to save the planet and make 20 kids like he is and name them weird. That's all you got to say is yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, there was another quote of his in the news this week too, where he said, you know, we got to keep, you know, drilling for oil and gas, yeah. but it's, I mean, it's just, that's just kind of an obvious statement but you know anything he says tends to to make the news so yeah i don't know if it's as big a problem as he says but uh i don't know we'll have we'll have it's a slow moving train wreck we'll, well hopefully you have know time to uh, the economies work on expansion like our right-wing government here and this prairie yeah. province farming agricultural centric and oil centric brings in immigrants so that the population can expand because nobody wants to live here. So they bring in desperate people <laughs> who will live anywhere <laughs> and are, or almost anywhere, but they will, that's what's going on. Uh, we're, our population's expanding. Our economy is moving because we need to build houses. We need to build more restaurants. We need to build more clothing stores and expand and roads and construction and all that. And, um, yeah. And I don't think the, the only reason they're doing it is not because they're, they care, it's because they want the economy to expand when otherwise it's not from. Yeah, we need an equal, uh, equilibrium where. But this, this know, is something that Rethink X, Tony Siba like, et al. Yeah. have talked about. They're starting to talk about deep things like this, like the world in the future is, you know, guaranteed incomes might be necessary. We have to rethink how people will make money when AI takes over a lot of jobs and uh, so forth. So yeah, it's a big question. Yeah. And yeah, and, and I don't think a lot of people are actually thinking about that because sometimes these things sneak up on you. Sometimes, you know, they can come faster than ever. Uh, okay, so back to Kia, we were talking about the EV6 not long ago. And uh, so they've got a GT version coming out. This is the all-electric Kia EV6. The GT version is going to be even faster, and I just like the headline here, we'll beat a Ferrari and a Lamborghini in a race. This is from uh, the Electrek website. 576 horsepower Kia hatchback, um, all-wheel drive, goes from 0 to 60 miles an hour in 3.4 seconds, 161 mile per hour top speed. So yeah, this is faster than a Ferrari Roma, faster than a Lamborghini Huracan or an Evo Spider. Um, and this is a reasonably priced, um, I don't think they've uh, announced the price yet, but this will be available will to customers. Will this be something uh, similar to year? your your little sports car that you had? Your, uh, what is it? The, uh, the Hyundai Veloster? Is it a different category or is it, uh, the is it more expensive? Um, yeah, I, I would still call it a, a hatchback, but it's probably called a crossover. It's, you know, it's the same as the EV6 crossover that we've but talked about But the Veloster before, was sold a nice as a sporty car. vehicle um, the, for those in midlife crisis or perhaps young people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is definitely more of a sporty version, but it, you know, it's got the same body shape. It's the same, it's basically the same car. But um, yeah, I don't know that it, it, and no word on the range either. The range on these is just kind of okay, I think. And you'll probably lose a bit of range with the extra fast version. But um, I don't know. I just think that's super okay. fun. Okay. Like Kia that goes that fast. Uh, the uh, mythical Tesla Roadster version two, which has been promised forever since the Cybertruck, or that, it's not the Cybertruck, the uh, Semi, uh, yeah. would go what, 2.9 without the rocket pack? Under two. Uh, no, be under two seconds because the, the plaid is already. Oh, so be like 1.9. The plaid 9. is already oh. under two seconds. So. 
Oh. Yeah, maybe even maybe even quicker. They've talked about putting. It's going to uh, have to SpaceX, shoot a looper uh, like you know, a, a adhesive there. down on the roadway so that it can not spin its tires at that speed. <laughs> wow. Yes, that's always an issue. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's just. Yeah. tire manufacturers are going to have to keep up. At first they were making low rolling resistance uh, fuel efficient tires for EVs. Now they have to make them so they can hug the road and, and not uh, not turn into dust uh, just when you accelerate. Uh, Brian, I have a very something I'm very interested in, and that is the uh, wind turbine visibility. I asked this question on our last show, and I said, does anybody out there know, is there a study? And sure enough, there is. Uh, the U.S. government, of all people, studied this very thing. And they have different categories. They did studies with, get this, professional lookers. <laughs> I don't know who these people are or what it takes to become one, but I commend you for having that on your business card because that is impressive. So the concern here is that if we put a bunch of offshore wind turbines off the coast, it's, it's wrecking, be unsightly you know, and an ocean be view is a beautiful their, thing. You know, they're ocean. Now you've got view. your ships out there. And in yeah. a lot of places you have warships. Yeah. I noticed like I was down in San Diego and not only were there warships, yeah. there was helicopters doing drills and, you know, right off the beach. So, and in fact, there was one that hovered, I swear, for an hour and a half, just Oh, it could have been. It's could probably have been Tom, Tom Cruise. Cruise just shooting a movie or what something. What am I thinking? It was Tom Cruise. Of course it was Tom <laughs> Cruise. Anyway, um, you know, we, we talked recently about uh, the Great Lakes because there was a study that said, you know, the Great Lakes can do well. There's some that are deeper than others. The smaller ones could do a significant yeah. power, but the Great Lakes hold enough uh, potential for wind energy to power the entire United States. And that's interesting because they're close to population centers, close to grid tie-ins. Well... Uh, these professional lookers came up with, they have different categories, lettered categories, D, E, and, and so forth. Uh -huh. And you've got your giant wind turbines, which are basically the, the ones that the, the extra large ones. So they have ratings for that. They have ratings for small, medium, and large. And, uh, they've rated them because, you know, you can see them in the distance where you can barely notice them. Or you can see them right in front of you and say, oh, that's ugly, and see the whole thing spinning. Or you can barely yeah. notice them, or you cannot see them at all. These are the different categories. So uh, category D was clearly visible with moderate impact becoming less distinct. Uh, e was less distinct, size is reduced, yada, yada, yada. Then you get down to negligible or no impact. Anyway, so neg negligible or no impact at all. For a small offshore wind turbine is 20 kilometers or 12.4 miles, okay? Now your biggest turbine, your extra large ones is up to 40 kilometers or 25 miles. And that is about how far France is away from, from the United Kingdom uh, at its closest, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but so, you know, it's, that's the answer. And that it's easy because you know, there's, there's always, environmental impacts and things like that. You don't want to have people disrupted, like, you know, uh, Ted Kennedy Jr. He was against wind farms off his coast, which are just now finally got approved this week. Um, that's how far it goes back, because he's no longer yeah. with us and for a long time. So, yeah, there's, uh, and, and somewhere in the middle, the low impact of movement is noticeable in good light, but not normally. And uh, so that's about 10 kilometers, 7.5 miles for a small one, and 22 to 27 kilometers or 13.7 miles for the biggest ones. Yeah, there is a way. And that's not that far uh, because on the east coast of North America, there is a large ocean shelf that makes, you know, oil drilling and this sort of thing really practical that hasn't been exploited yet. Um, yeah. So there's great potential there. And we were talking about Japan recently, which only has a 25 kilometer shelf, uh, but floating, uh, wind turbines could go further than that if you wanted to. So yeah, there's, uh, I'll, uh, I'll put this chart in the show notes and you can have a look at it yourself. Um, and I, it, again, it was the U S department of energy. So the, the biggest turbines, again, suggest about 40 kilometers away and smaller ones, 20 kilometers, if you don't want to have sort of any negligible visual impact. 
And getting back to what I was just talking about from Clean Technica, the Cape Cod Offshore Wind Project, America's first, believe it or not, is finally officially moving ahead after years of opposition. The Vineyard Wind One is described as the nation's first commercial scale offshore wind farm. The project will utilize 62 13 megawatt um, Halliad X wind turbines. Those are the big mothers, the big, big ones. Uh, the biggest ones there are, they're talking about slightly bigger ones now, but those are huge. I think each, you know, the, the, the wind sweep is like two football fields. It's just massive. Um, and they're also going to have an offshore substation yeah. out there. And that power will be transferred to shore via two 220 volt cables. This is the thing that the locals were concerned about. They weren't concerned any longer about the offshore um, visibility, they were more concerned about the cables that had to go through town. So what they did is they made a deal with the town and said that they're going to, it's called Covell's Beach, and they're going to um, dig up the roads and put the cable under the roads. And while those roads are dig dug up, they're going to fix the infrastructure of sewers and whatnot and storm drains, and that's going to save them money. So the 800 megawatt project, that is, you know, approaching a nuclear reactor in output is located 15 miles off the coast. So it's fairly close. And these are the big ones. So you will see them uh, and they will generate electricity for more than 40,000 homes and businesses in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and create 3,600 full-time equivalent job hours. That's not jobs, that's job hours. And of course, what we like to talk about, it's going to save customers of electricity 1.4 billion dollars over the first 20 years of operation. Uh, so clean energy people saves the planet and saves your wallet because energy, uh, you know, I saw a study that said people's electricity bills, even by 2030, will be reduced by $9 a month or something like that. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's happening. It's, uh, you know, and by the time we get to our climate goals, hopefully at 2040 to 2050, electricity is going to be given away. A lot of times. Fantastic. Uh, okay, another story here from Electric. Um, they're reporting on Bosch, the um, electric motor and appliance company. Uh, they've come up with anti-lock brakes for electric brakes, which is something I never thought of, never thought was even maybe necessary. But um, I just like this story because it's a good example of the progress that we could make once we start taking these kinds of things seriously, like electric bikes. So, um, yeah, you know, we've had anti-lock brakes in cars for years. Um, I didn't like them at first because it seemed like kind of unnecessarily complicated. And, you know, I was worried it was just going to be one of those things that, you know, brakes on your car, like, uh, like quits, quits working. I mean, doesn't mean brakes, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. They've been great. It's anti-lock brakes are great where we live in the winter because you can stomp on the brakes and not slide around on the ice. You can still keep steering your car. Um, you know, when when you just lock up the wheels in your car, you can't steer. Like you just have to slide around like an, an idiot. But anti-lock brakes give you a little bit more control. So it only makes sense to do this on bicycles as well. So these were shown off at Eurobike 2022. Um, an exhibition recently in Europe and uh, Electrek took these for a ride and uh, it looks fantastic. Have you ever locked up your front brakes I on a bike and talk about flown it. over the handlebars? Uh, that's how bad it is. I mean, uh, <laughs> we were t uh, talking before the show about the evolution of home videos and the cameras. Well, that, that little flip camera, guess how it got broken? Yeah. <laughs> going over my handlebars down a hill. <laughs> going over your handlebars? It was a mountain biking course. <laughs> <laughs> and it did go down quicker than I thought. And I, there was just, uh, it's, 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 I could have paralyzed myself, you know, it's, it's a nest. <laughs> I basically did a somersault as a yeah, much yeah. lighter man, but it was not pleasant. And this was only about eight years ago, seven years ago. Uh, yeah, it was scary. And I would, yeah. you know, your whole body feels like it got hit by a truck and then you sort of shake it off. Is anything broken? Yeah. So in the answer to your query, yes. But I've also run into cars when I was a kid, parked cars. Yeah. Because, you know, I daydreamed. As Mrs. Um, Peichel was right in my grade one report card. I do like, Jamie does like to daydream. 
because I did run into a couple of cars, <laughs> which is not good. Yeah. I, I One time in my 20s, I went over my front handlebars. Um, it's no fun. But yeah, anti-lock brakes will absolutely be fantastic. So hopefully that starts to become. And they mentioned here in yeah. the article that it's great for things like cargo bikes. So um, electric cargo bikes are going to be a huge thing in cities for doing deliveries and stuff. And, uh, you know, that's a particular case where you can get a lot of momentum with a cargo, kind of a heavy cargo bike. And you don't want to be locking up those wheels in any way. So, I'd be curious yeah, to try them. Nice and, you know, I, I remember when I used to go to the bicycle shops a lot that they used to go away to the bike shows this time of year. This is the exact time of year when the bike show, bike conventions are on and yeah. all your greasy bike mechanics from the local shops go yeah. out and on vacation and, <laughs> and do God knows what in Las Vegas. Anyway, uh, that's interesting. And, you know, Brian, bicycles e-bikes, not e-motorcycles, not electric motorcycles, but bikes are going over highway speeds now because occasionally you will see them with that spec with a new bike announcement on electric or somewhere. And if, yeah. you know, and I'm thinking, okay, uh, A, that's not good, <laughs> but it's all about control, right? So if you do have anti-lock brakes, <laughs> then that may change the equation. I mean, I, I'm scared going at my, you know, the peak of my e-bikes you know, 25 miles an hour type of thing. So I don't know. Brian, um, I, we've got many press releases and I, I got one that I was kind of interested in doing the interview on. And that is because uh, last week, the chancellor of uh, Germany was coming to our country to make uh, various announcements and agreements. And on his last day, on Tuesday, he went out to the east coast of Newfoundland and Labrador and was making an announcement about green hydrogen. And one of the countries in Canada that is trying to do green hydrogen out there got a hold of me and wanted me to interview the CEO. Now, our schedule's never hooked up, and I'm, you know, I did, but I started doing research into it, and I started to get ill feelings about the whole thing, about A, green hydrogen and how is this viable, and B, like, are these companies just sort of jumping on, you know, the government teat at the time when they're desperate to fight climate change and is this legitimate? You know, I was starting to feel like I was just getting bad vibes about the whole thing. So I did some research into green hydrogen and I came to the conclusion that the first thing that we should use green hydrogen for is not Germany's electricity needs to, you know, get off uh, Russian fuels, fossil fuels, but to use it for, you know, what it's used for now. And it's used in oil refinery, 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 oil refinery, uh, ammonia production and methanol production, as well as steel production. And I think maybe some cement production is possible as well. So ammonia is used in fertilizers. So if we can get off the ungreen hydrogen now that makes emissions, when you make that hydrogen, that's where we should first apply this. Uh, 4% of hydrogen in the world is currently yeah. green. That's not very much. And there's uh, a great expense to how they do it. What they do with green hydrogen is they use an a process called electrolysis, where you put... Um, you know, basically two high electric probes in water and you split the water's atoms and separate the hydrogen from it. That's very energy intense. And those electrolysis machines are yeah. um, very expensive now. And they're trying to get them down in price like wind and solar. But there's some debate as to how that's even possible. So they're talking about shipping it to Germany. And in order to do that, because hydrogen is, is not like gasoline, you have to cool it down and make it or make it solid, okay? Because you can't, it just takes up so much volume. So you have to make it really cold. Now you can make uh, ammonium cold, but not as cold and, and do that. You don't have to make it as cold. You can turn it back into hydrogen again uh, on the other side. But all, all this, you know, the person we were going to talk to, he, he bought this brownfield oil uh, storage facility in Nova Scotia. And he plans on putting up wind turbines, 100, 100 or so wind turbines to power the place in phase one and offshore for phase two. And he's put $100 million of his own money into it because he's a rich guy with lots of investments uh, from prior times in, 
he has expertise in, in setting something like this up. But yeah, I mean, it's it's 160 wind turbines on shore that the locals aren't thrilled about, and they're sort of getting it shoved down their throats really quickly. They haven't had time. And that's, you know, all these things take time. But he's got this brownfield oil storage place, which apparently is great. Uh, and there's a sh deep shipping channel there of, uh, I, f I think it's like 27 meters or something. So you can get ships in and out to, to ship it. Uh, and that's all you, that's what a big, you know, step forward for that, this particular company. But there are critics say 24 separate government agencies right now that have to provide the stamp for this to go forward, uh, for something like this. That's a lot. And that means years and years and years and years and years. Yeah, well, back to that issue of complication. Uh, you know, it's it's so much more complicated than and that, you know. That's solar, my wind thought. And it's complicated is expensive, and yeah, I mean, you can make green ammonium from you know, makes fertilizer if you want, but I don't know if we should making be making fertilizer right now unless we don't unless it's you know, offsetting something else. But it's just. You know, in Alberta, they have, uh, they streamlined oil exploration and development so that you go to one agency and they take care of everything. We're going to have to do something like that if, if things like hydrogen are going to be sped up. Because yeah. we, you know, that's a problem with solar. Like Australia took away the green tape or the red tape rather and, uh, and replace it with green tape and it makes it uh, cheaper it and tape. faster. And faster means cheaper because you don't have to the, the sit around and. And, and all that. So it's just a better process. So it expanded really rapidly once they did that. So there's also blue hydrogen, which they're making next door in Alberta, in the uh, oil-rich province of Alberta. Uh, but they say they're going to capture that uh, carbon, that, that is, that's from natural gas. So you have to capture, capture you know, the emissions from that, and that's not practical. Yeah, so green hydrogen is made with clean electricity, so it should be 100% emissions free. Blue hydrogen is made from fossil fuels, but you can capture the and carbon. And there's lots and of hydrogen projects kind of going on in the hydrogen. world, lots of them, and this will be maybe one of the first in North America. But the thing is, you know, it's just going to take so much time. I don't doubt that there's going to be an appetite for a market for it, okay? There's going to be an insatiable market to buy green hydrogen, just like there's an insatiable market to buy green energy. Amazon wants to, you know, have green energy. They yeah. put up a million solar farms or whatever, like uh, dozens and hundreds of them. I don't know. Yeah. And they'll just do that. And Microsoft, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's happening, but... And people will want green hydrogen as well and green steel made from green hydrogen. So we'll see. And yeah, Germany seems to be definitely on the forefront of this hydrogen. And there was a story, this was from CNN, that uh, the very first hydrogen powered train line has now started running uh, full time in Germany. So uh, they've got 14 hydrogen powered trains. These are fuel cell hydrogen vehicles, so emissions-free, and as long as the hydrogen is made in an emissions-free way, then this is an emissions-free system. I, I don't know. It doesn't say how the hydrogen is made. I'd be surprised if it's fully green hydrogen. But uh, yeah, this is a thing that is actually working now, and that they still have some diesel trains that they plan to replace. But, uh, you know, this project has started. They have about a 1,000 kilometer range on these hydrogen trains. And, um, you know, so they can run, basically do their route all day without refilling, but they just have refilling stations at, at either end of the line. And, uh, well, yeah, this is the thing that's... Uh, in California, working. California has like, I don't know, maybe 34 hydrogen refilling stations and for cars. And there's like six and maybe Vermont cars, or somewhere yeah. for Bernie, Bernie's friends. Yeah. But they're all in California. Yeah. Half of them aren't working. It's very expensive to fill your car. Very expensive. Uh, I mean, it's, they're, they're hoping to get the electric cost of these electrolyzers down where they could fuel a vehicle and be cost competitive with fossil fuels and they won't even need blue hydrogen. But, you know, you, you need to be able to commit to that, that there needs to be a, just the, just the difficulty of refueling and transporting is just such a, a major thing to do. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's almost like you need your green hydrogen plant right next to where the storage is, like for this train line. If they could actually make the green hydrogen at both ends of the rail line, but it's it's just probably not uh, practical to do that everywhere. And the question my partner asked when they were watching the hydrogen. news story on TV is, why doesn't Germany make their own damn green hydrogen? Well, I, I looked into that, and <laughs> yeah. they do yeah. have a coastline. They do have places to put wind. Um, but they claim it's just not as much coast, not as enough coastline as other people. So, yeah, we, um, Nova Scotia is very windy. They don't have good solar resources. Uh, and Newfoundland and Labrador also have good, very good wind resources. And ironically, I'm looking at the, the solar chart for Newfoundland. You know where the best uh, solar potential is for Newfoundland? It's way better the, the most extreme north that you go. So it's actually just... A weather thing. Hmm. I think there's just a lot of wow. clouds in the, the south. But even, yeah, you're getting really close to the Arctic cloud, up there yeah. um, in Labrador, when, and then there's just better solar resources than there is down south. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, okay, so there was a fantastic article um, this week from Power Magazine, written by Sonal Patel. And I just wanted to talk about this because it's a, a, a really a follow-up to a lot of these things that we're talking about, the complications of you know, these different types of power. So we've been talking about Germany. They have been trying to phase out their nuclear power plants. This is really part of a political platform. People in Germany don't really want their nuclear power anymore. So they have so far shut down three of the six nuclear power plants that they have had in Germany. So uh, just last year, Nuclear was supplying about 12% of the electricity needs in Germany. That's now down to 6% with just these three uh, nuclear power plants remaining. But of course, as we know, uh, Europe and Germany in particular is in a bit of an energy crisis this year because they've been relying on uh, fossil fuel imports from Russia. And those are now in doubt and nobody really wants to uh, talk to Russia anymore. We don't want their stinky oil and gas. So... Um, there's been a lot of talk about, well, should they delay the closing of these last three nuclear plants in Germany? And it's like, on the surface, well, that seems like a great idea. It's, you know, this is a carbon-free form of electricity. Just keep them running a little bit longer, another year or two, then maybe then, you know, they can find a different uh, plan instead of relying on this Russian oil and gas. But this article was so great because it really went through the complications in doing that. Like, that sounds like a simple thing. Just keep the plants running for another year or two. But uh, I'll go through some of the uh, legal and regulatory hurdles that was mentioned in this um, article. Because, of course, like, you know, solar, wind, and batteries, something like that, it's fairly simple. Like, you and I could literally build a solar, you know, wind and battery power plant, basically. Like you have one in your camper, you put up a solar panel, mm -hmm. you charge it in a battery, boom, it's pretty simple. But nuclear can be extremely dangerous. So over the years, we've created all of these laws and regulations. So um, the first hurdle, the reactors cannot be operated beyond 2022, December, under Germany's Atomic Energy Act, and prolonging their operation will require an amendment to the law. They would literally have to change the law, which they can do, uh, to keep these plants running beyond 2022. Um, there would also be, um, you know, an environmental impact assessment that would have to be done. And this would have to abide by a European uh, court agreement. Um, as well, there uh, have to be a comprehensive risk and benefit assessment by Germany's legislature. Uh, that would balance assessments. Uh, this was created after the Fukushima accident in 2011. R regulations got more severe. Uh, so there's a bit more here in terms of regulations. Uh, the reactors would need to address safety and security requirements. Uh, because they're slated for shutdown in December 22, uh, 2022, a legal exception under the Atomic Energy Act would uh, have allowed them to buy, has already allowed them to bypass their 10 year safety review which should have occurred in 2019. So they're already three years past. They were given a sort of a special exemption. So continuing, you know, beyond that, they're, you know, they're already 13 years past, um, you know, the, the last major kind of safety inspections. Uh, continued operation would only make sense if the safety review were significantly reduced in scope 
and the test depth or extensive retrofitting um, might be, you know, kind of simplified. You, you'd have to basically change all of these safety rules and kind of let everything slide for uh, a couple of more years. Um, they're also running out of fuel. So the fuel elements in the plant have been largely used up. They have enough fuel for only about 80 days of extended operation past that uh, December 2022 shutdown point. Procuring new fuel is a lengthy process that could take between 18 and 24 months. If you did a super accelerated version, maybe 12 to 15 months. Um, so the fuel is a huge problem. Uh, there would also have to be testing of this new fuel. Like, you know, you don't just come up with nuclear fuel. Um, it's an extremely difficult process. Uh, making sure there's enough staff. So they could have staffing issues if they continue beyond this date. I imagine a lot of the staff have already made other plans to uh, go on to other jobs. So uh, there would have to be extensive human resources coordinated and people trained. Um, what else here? This is just like, it's just a long nightmare of things. Uh, there's the financial consideration. So again, doing all of this stuff to extend it beyond its normal date, this is going to cost even more money than it has been costing. Um, you know, this is, this is going to be expensive electricity if they keep it running. Um, now there is of course a nuclear business and technology association called ChemD. Um, they disagree with some of these conclusions that, um, in their view, it, basically it's worth it. You know, th this is a massive crisis facing Europe and Germany, this massive energy shortage, um, so they think that all of these extra measures that would be needed, um, you know, are probably worth it. Uh, but I'm not so sure. And, and the fact that they're down to only 6% of the German electricity generation with these last three plants, you know, hopefully they can come up with another 6% somewhere. Or Russia could just go home yeah. and get out of the Ukraine and be nice. Yeah. Um, and hopefully, you know, punished somehow but but yeah that's it's, it's know, phenomenal it's, I, I understand they are going to try and keep three running right like that yeah there's been sort of do conflicting best. reports they had said no 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 we're not going to extend them but now uh, you know it sounds like they're considering it and uh, yeah. i guess we'll see okay well brian it's uh <laughs> we're going way over on the show this week but uh i want to mention coming up on the show is the lightning round where we'll have uh, a skim of the rest of the week's headlines real quick let's dip into some of our feedback from the web uh, we have a doordash driver says he bought a chevy bolt euv that's the slightly larger version of the bolt uh, with the uh, crossover styling took the ev out door dashing this evening this is a person who works as a doordash delivery person it's a great car for food delivery the first order of the day pays for all <laughs> of the fuel i need and again you know, and I, I can sit in the AC listening to music between orders without worrying about overheating. And this is a person who lives down in the States and it's a perfect DoorDash car. We hear that a lot. Yeah. And of course, one of my pet peeves we've mentioned on the show is you'll often see people around here with, sitting in <clears throat> normal weather with the engine running. And I always am confused by that. It's like, oh, do they really need the you know, the AC running, it's not that hot out, et cetera, et cetera, wasting all that fuel. But I had, I was in my gas powered car the other day, just with the engine off and listening to the radio. And after about a minute, a warning comes up on the screen saying, oh, you know, you shouldn't be running your AV system without, you know, the engine running because you're going to run your yeah. battery down. Um, maybe, so maybe that's why everyone's running their cars when they don't have to, because the little s well, screen is telling them to. No, it's, it's, it's life experience. And I can't believe you've never had this experience. You've never run your battery down and been stranded. It, it takes, from it takes a thing. long time, you know. Oh, Mr. Stockton with his good quality batteries. <laughs> okay. okay. Not somebody who's stretching the life of his battery because he's poor. Well, I've run into that before when I was a kid and I've learned my lesson and I think a lot of people have, and that's why they don't turn it off. Yeah. You know what I'm hearing a lot of now is people like uh, pickup trucks automatically shutting off the engine at stoplights. Yeah. But really how much is that saving you? 
it, it's uh, a minute or two of idling here and there. It's a little bit. They, it's, it's something that should have been implemented 20 years ago, and that might have made a difference, but uh, it's, it's a little too, too little too late. Yeah, but the, it's so archaic because the engine literally has to start just like you're turning the key over, you know? Like it's just, yeah, you, seems like it's wear and tear. You on need it a more long. robust starter, but I think at the end it does save a bit of fuel and pollution. All right. I have a question here on Twitter from Alternative Frequency. That's his handle. He is a trucker who says, the trucker in the United States that says, we are one of his five favorite podcasts. Fantastic. Uh, that they listen to. And some of the others are Dr. Volts, which is a paid podcast on um, Substack. And Inside EVs, of course, which is a popular one. And Undecided with Matt Farrell, which is a spinoff of his YouTube channel. I use Matt Farrell's Undecided for information. He is not a professional, but he does research well yeah. and, and has good videos. So question for all of us, and we are the only ones that go back to him because we're good and decent people, Brian, <laughs> even with your back. It says, home batteries seem to cost roughly $1,000 per kilowatt hour. But the F-150 Lightning pickup truck has 93 kilowatt hours for about $40,000. And the Silverado, announced Silverado EV will be 200 kilowatt hours for about 40K. And I don't think either of those are actually 40K, by the way. Yeah. They're, they're already upping the prices like Tesla is due to inflation. Yeah. And well, and um, how much is, but the, that's the whole cost of the vehicle or just the cost of the battery pack? That's the cost of the vehicle. That's the starting price, the supposed starting price. Yeah. I mean, this is for the fleet version of those vehicles. But his question is, is home storage priced too high and are EV trucks priced too low? Uh, is it not about the capacity? Uh, I think that's a complicated question with a complicated answer with multifacets. I'll add one before you do. Um, you know, they want to, Tesla, for example, wants to sell their vehicles. That's their primary. Yeah motivation is to keep their company going by selling vehicles. So they'll put their batteries into the vehicles and they'll overprice the battery storage to, so that everybody's not buying it. I'm sure the battery storage could be cheaper for Tesla, maybe half as much. Yeah, well, they, they've got a waiting we list buy for everything, use up so a, now's not the time to We use prices. all their batteries and they wouldn't be able to make vehicles and that would kill their business. That's one reason. Do you have other reasons? Not really, but, you know, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, the home batteries have seemed awfully expensive to me. But, um, you know, the, uh, and it's also quite possible that Ford is losing money on these trucks and that Chevy is going to lose yeah. money on these trucks. We don't know for sure. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not really sure. If you have any thoughts, Clean Energy Show at gmail.com or on Twitter, on Facebook. We're not on Facebook. It took us off Facebook. We're on TikTok, of course, and uh, YouTube. Check us out. We have speakpipe.com slash clean energy show to leave us a voicemail message and we'd love to hear from you anything you have to say on this or any other subject brian it is time for of course the lightning round the lightning round is where we uh, skim through a few more headlines really quick to end the show and it's one of our favorite shows it was a uh, a new segment, almost two years ago, almost selling the, almost celebrating the two-year anniversary of the lightning round, and believe me, there will be cake this year. I hope. Uh, Tesla says autopilot is preventing forty crashes per day from wrong pedal error driving, and when this came out, somebody had crashed their car into a building, and in, 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 no, they had killed, it crashed it into a wedding, in uh, on the west coast of Canada, and killed two people. And you occasionally see the elderly doing this in front of a store. Um, I was teaching my daughter how to drive and she wanted to use her left foot for the brake. And I said, mm -hmm. no, uh, there's a reason for that. And this is the reason you, you stick to the right foot and you go back and forth. Um, so the use of the autopilot sensor to mitigate torque when it's sure the car is sure that the input was a mistake. Uh, yeah. So that, what do you think of that? That seems high. Yeah. But. Well, it's, it's like saving 40 crashes a day means this is a really common, a way more common problem than I yeah. might have thought it is. Because if it's just 40 a day in Teslas, imagine the entire fleet of cars. But I think when we first talked about this a couple of years ago on the podcast, I mentioned the, I think it was called the Audi 5000. So way back in the late seventies or the early eighties, Audi had a huge PR problem in North America because 
of sudden unintended acceleration. And it was believed that these Audi cars were faulty and they would just suddenly accelerate into a building, they would accelerate into traffic, etc., etc. And it was eventually determined it was just driver error. But there was, I think, like a 60 Minutes report on it that suddenly scared everybody off of buying an Audi. Uh, so yeah, this is apparently a very common problem, people pressing the wrong pedal. And there was also something just about Priuses that killed their popularity that was a big dent on them because Toilo was such a reliable vehicle. It turned out it was just the floor mats sticking on the driver pedal. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. And so they, they bolt down the floor yeah. mats now so they can't move. I've had problems uh, with my and, floor mats in different cars too, yeah. Yeah, so that was, it took them forever to figure it out too, you know, to absolutely figure it out. A small Vermont utility, which uses Tesla power walls from customers, speaking of this very thing, in a virtual grid backup system. So there's 4,000 Tesla power walls uh, hooked up in people's homes to the grid, and they found out that you know, the first thoughts on this is that it's saving them a lot of money. Uh, in fact, $1.5 million in one week this summer. What? Now, I don't know how you save one. I don't understand the nuances of grid. I mean, you have to fire up a plant. You have to, maybe you lose some hardware during this situation that you wouldn't have otherwise lost. But they, they're sure that it, that they've saved $3 million since um, twenty in 2021 and just $1.5 million in a heat wave this summer. Uh, so, yeah, again... Yeah, we there's a, another virtual power plant project happening in Japan right now. There's a big one happening in California, also with Tesla Powerwalls. They're, they can all be networked. Um, so, yeah, I think eventually it won't really be so much about saving money necessarily. It's just kind of stabilizing the grid. Once, once electricity... But stabilizing apparently saves money. I don't understand why, but the, it is. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Brian... It's time for a clean energy show fast fact. Pakistan is responsible for 1% of global emissions, yet it is the sixth most climate vulnerable country in the world, proving that the climate change impacts affect poor countries disproportionately. Yeah, and of course there's been massive flooding in Pakistan these last uh, this last week or so, absolutely devastating, you know, kind of what was Normally, once in a hundred year kind of situation is is now sadly much more frequent. And speak, speaking of which, new scientist says that the heat wave in China this summer is the most severe ever recorded in the world. People in large parts of China have been experiencing two months of extreme heat, and uh, it's been forty degrees and and terrible things. The worst one in history, Brian. But we have to go. Uh, I have to say that because my battery's dying on my laptop, so we have to go so I don't lose the file. <laughs> that is our time for this week. We'll see you again next week for another edition of the Clean Energy Show. See you next week.